Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This week, the hockey community suffered a grave tragedy. We've all heard about it now, the Humboldt Broncos junior team and the bus accident that killed 15 team members. We here at Fireside Chat send our deepest sympathies to everyone involved. And we encourage everyone listening to help in whatever way you can. If you can donate some money, there's various different places online to donate. Uh, do what you can do for Humboldt, for the players, for the families. This is something that we never like to see in the hockey community. No, I've been inspired by how much the entire hockey community at large has rallied around these kids and the whole community in Saskatchewan. Like Just a terrible senseless accident uh, it's just horrible well with that i'm dan and this is matt and we're here i guess for last time this season matt to talk calgary flames hockey yep just uh f- it was a good end to the season with the 7-1 win but yeah i'm glad that the games are over now and can start looking forward to the off season and how to fix this. Well, we will talk about those three games that finished up the season, and then we'll do a complete, uh, I guess, look back and autopsy of this team and where we're at and how we got to where we are and maybe see if we can fix some things. Yep. So the first game of the week, the Flames took on a team they shouldn't have lost to, but we all knew if they shouldn't have lost, they probably would, and they took on the Arizona Coyotes and got bested 4-1. to one. Uh, four different Coyotes, Panic, Con- Connaughton, F- uh, Fisher, and Strom all got a goal on this one. The only Calgary goal, it was his first as a flame, came from Nick Shore in the second period. Thoughts on this game? Uh, Arizona's been hot of late, and after they struggled to start the season, like most teams, most people thought that Arizona would be roughly around where Calgary ended up finishing. And they they just got off to such an awful start. And they were, frankly, better as a team than they showed until that game. And it it is what it is. Calgary needs to step up, and they didn't. And, you know, the game doesn't really matter. So it is what it is. Yeah, I think we saw some interesting line combos in this one. I mean, we have our starters out, and I really liked in this game, I was there. I really liked what we saw from Shore in this game. I thought he looked really good, and I liked what we saw from Fu in this game. I agree. And Fu, in his entire call-up, has looked rather impressive, and he may end up getting a spot next year, which I wouldn't have thought, but he acquitted himself rather well. He has some things that he has to work on, of course, like every player, uh, young player coming into next season. But he, he showed enough there where he has put himself into a co- the conversation, at least, to push for a roster spot. Just do, I think he, do I think he would be more than the fourth liner? Probably not, but, you know, it, it's possible. Just looking at our forward ranks and our forward depths, I honestly think he would be better to be kept in the AHL next year and give him just a bigger AHL role. I'd rather see that than him playing on the fourth line. If we're on a fourth line guy, we got Lomberg. We got other guys who can do that. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I think if, you know, Foo seems to be feeling better now about pro hockey now that he's done his first year, and, you know, maybe he can really light it up in the AHL in his second year. Yeah. And I think uh, to compare him with an Oiler, I, he reminds me a little bit of Drake Kajula. Just somebody that he's okay. And, you know, you could throw him on the third or fourth line, and I don't think it'd be too much of a problem at the NHL level. Whether Fu has that further upside where he could emerge as a top six forward is yet to be seen. But I think he's as close of a forward prospect as we have to be an NHL roster player to start next year. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, at least, yeah, I don't know. I think you're right. About at, at least of as of today. And, you know, things can change. Yeah, I think you're right about the Kajula reference. I don't think he's the best forward we've got as far as starting. He's pretty close. But I think there's some other guys that 
might emerge above him. Not yet, but I think there's other guys that might emerge over the summer and over the training camp. Oh, of course. And we also don't have a lot of forward spots. No. Uh, the next game, the I guess the only game really of this week that I thought somewhat had some weight to it was Calgary playing Winnipeg, and Hellebuck ties the record for most wins by a U.S.-born goalie in one season as the Winnipeg Jets bested the Flames 2-1. to one. Jets got goals by Wheeler and Stasny, and the guy we were just talking about, Spencer Fu, got his first NHL goal in this game, which was nice to see. Yep. And that's pretty much the main takeaway is that Fu got his first, and that's about it. It was a bit of a boring game overall, I thought. But, I, you know, it was the game I expected for both these teams where we're at. True. Exactly. You know, Winnipeg had nothing to play for. Winnipeg was just trying not to get hurt. Um, you know, the Flames really, as much as they'd like to win for pride, had nothing to play for. No. And then last game of the year and last game of the week, the Calgary Flames got a big win uh, against a team they haven't been able to win against so far this season. They got a 7-1 win in the Dome to cap off the season against the Golden Knights. Pretty much everybody scores in this game, but the most impressive is Mark Jankowski gets four goals in one game. His 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th of the year as the Flames best of the Knights. This one I'll start off by saying this was a game that looked like the last game of the season. Vegas just didn't seem like they cared, and Calgary just seemed like they wanted to at least get one win over Vegas. Yeah, pretty much. And it's too bad that uh, Janko lost the handle on the puck in the last minute, otherwise he would have made somebody a million bucks. But, you know, not much you can do on that one. Yeah, for those that don't know, there's a contest here that if one player scores five goals in a game, somebody, I think it's sponsored by Safeway still? Safeway and Sobeys. Somebody, yeah, same company, Safeway, Sobeys, somebody uh, wins a million bucks. I remember a couple years ago, what was it? There's some contest where if you got five points in a game, you won a car, and Giordano missed a penalty shot or something, cost a guy a car, and bought it for him anyways. Do you remember that story? No, not. No, I'd, I'd have to go back and look it up. I remember something like that, but. Um, I bet Janko could use a hundred bucks. He's still a rookie, or a million bucks. He's still a rookie. I wonder if he can enter and then score his own five goals. Well, that wraps up the flame season. Not much to talk about there. So why don't we jump right into uh, recapping this season? What do you think, Matt? Oh, uh, sounds like a plan. You and I had some optimistic outlooks of this season going in. You and I talked just before the season started and made some predictions for what we thought might happen. I thought it'd be a good time to look back at those and see what we got right, what we got wrong. Knowing where the season ended up, we probably got a lot wrong, but let's look back. Yeah, well, when the everything did go wrong for the Flames this season, there's not really much you can do. <laughs> but, I mean, none of us predicted that the Flames would be out of the playoffs. No. So, uh, the first question that we asked in the offseason was, who do you expect to have a breakout season? And we said nobody could say Sam Bennett because the coach was very high on Bennett thinking he'd have a great season. You thought TJ Brody would have a, a breakout season? Didn't turn out to be so, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I suggested it would be Dougie Hamilton or Curtis Lazar. I want to give myself a point for Hamilton. I think we really saw him grow and mature this year. I wouldn't say it's a breakout season, but especially after Christmas, he really got a lot better. Yeah, he still needs to work on his defensive game a bit, but there's one thing that with him that I'd like to see next year on the power play, and is to put him on Ovechkin Island. And put him as the left wing on the first power play unit because of his slap and wrist shot. I think that would be a good spot for him to generate some power play goals, which is something that kind of tanked the flame season this year. Yeah, that could work. I've seen a lot of people talking too, and you've floated this about various guys in the past of, is it worth trying to make Dougie into a winger because of the way that he shoots? But, you know, I think we really need that on our blue line right now. Well, that's why I was thinking maybe you just utilize him in that fashion, just on the power play and, because his shot is pretty good from that distance so it could feasibly work it's you know and especially with the flames having as many offensive defensemen that they do you could roll with say giordano and brody on power play unit one with hamilton at um monahan and gaudreau conceivably or there's a whole bunch of different ways you could do it really yeah, and I think especially if they can get, I mean, not a great, uh, you know, 
thing to look forward to because never get them. But I think especially if we can get a two-man power play, as you know, five on three, that'd be really, really good thing to do there as well. Yeah. And one thing I'd also like to see is with the power play specifically is to have the defensemen uh, playing on their offsides so that way their sticks are pointing towards the center of the ice instead of the boards. Just due to the fact that it sets up one-timers a little easier because I think that's another part of the reason why the team struggled on the power play because everybody, like uh, the, you have Giordano and Hamilton with their sticks on the boards, they have to like corral the puck then shoot instead of just wiring it yeah they kind of gotta take the puck then turn themselves around and then make a shot and you know it, when it comes to nhl hockey you need to basically on your stick off your stick as soon as possible otherwise teams can get people in the way for sure uh the next thing we talked about is who might struggle this season who do we think would have a noticeable struggle you mentioned some interesting names. You mentioned Brett Kulak, who I think was the opposite. I think this was really Kulak's breakout season. Yeah, same here. I thought that he was great. Uh, completely off the mark there. I mean, we have to remember last season he was being benched for you know other guys, including Bartkowski. They almost didn't want to play Kulak last year, and he had to fight his way into the lineup. Yep. Uh, you thought Michael Backlund might have a struggle this season, and I think, again, he's... I wouldn't say he's looked great, but he looked like what we expect Backlund to look like. Yeah, it, he did not down the stretch, but up until he signed... Did. Yeah, up until he signed the contract, everything was fine, and then him and the rest of the team kind of went off the rails. And the third guy you predicted, and I guess you're right with this one, was Eddie Lack. <laughs> yeah, well... Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a guy who was a starter last year, went to being the Flames backup to the Flames AHL team, to being traded to the New Jersey yeah. AHL team, and then back to the NHL yep. with New Jersey. This is the guy who's racked up some air miles this year. It'll be interesting to see what happens to Eddie Lack next year and where he plays and if he plays. I think he's going Europe bound, and if he has a good season or two, then he might come back. I doubt it, though. I think his career's done in the NHL. My prediction for guys that might struggle was Michael Furland. And I think Michael Furland got saved from that a little bit by being on the first line and playing with Johnny and Monty. I think there's a lot of guys that could have played on that line and looked as good, if not better. But that really helped him. Yeah. And Furland, his shot is good. But, like, the rest of his game is, like, third, fourth liner material. And... Like, that shot is great. Like, he, you know, he has a first, second line caliber shot. It's just there's nothing else. And it's sort of like when the Flames play Glen Cross on the first line. It's like, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, and it to me speaks to, I guess, our right wing and sort of the lack of depth there that this is the best right winger we've got. So hopefully that's something that we'll see addressed in the off season. Yeah, it better be. <laughs> Priority number one. <laughs> yeah, and I think we all acknowledge that. Uh, the next question that we looked at was, how do you expect the goalie workload to be vi divided up? You thought it'd be 55-26. This time we assumed it was going to be uh, Smith and Lack. I assumed it would be 60-20. Sort of a weird divide because we ended up using four goalies this year. Mike Smith did indeed play 55 games. You were right. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. We, we had a 36 combined games, not just starts, but combined games. Um, and all of all of those were starts for Smith. He yeah. never came in in relief, period. But if you look at our other goaltenders, David Riddick played 21 games this season. John Gillies played 11 games for the Calgary Flames. And Eddie Lack played four games, which makes up those 36 additional games this season. I don't think anyone expected us to use four goaltenders this season. I mean, we had our two NHL guys, Lack and Smith, and then we essentially started both of our AHL goalies this year as well. Yeah. The next question we asked is, will Smith finally provide the goaltending that we need? We've struggled here, as you and I talked about at the beginning of the season, since really Kiprasov left, and we both suggested that, yes, he would. And I think in a lot of ways, this team got saved and looked better than they should have for most of the season because of Smitty. Yep, and you have to look at the losses that he uh, had this season. I think it was 16 of the, those losses. The Flames scored zero or one goal. And 
I think that it's hard, it's damn near impossible for any goaltender in the league to be successful when your team's not scoring. And frankly, the team was absolutely dreadful this season at scoring goals. And when the team was actually chipping in offense, the Flames would usually come out on top. And especially down the stretch, we continually would see games where we'd just score like one or two goals, and if that. And... Uh, that's the, one of the main reasons why the Flames failed this season. Sure, and I think the thing that Smitty really gave us this year was that ability to have a goaltender to steal a game for us. There were times when the team wasn't playing well and you knew that Smitty would be the difference maker. And when was the last time we had that here in Calgary? I don't think we've really had it since Kippersoff. Yeah, pretty much. Like, uh, I think Kari Ramo might have stolen a game or two. I think Ordeo stole a game or, or, or two. Any but, starter should be able to steal one or two, but they're not guys you look at to do that as a regular thing. No, but it was, uh, yeah. Between Kipper and Smith, it was like the occasional... Like it, it, Johnson last year had a run where he was unstoppable, but it, yeah, that was like a month-long stretch, and then he faded. So, it, yeah, I... Uh, Smith has been the best goalie since Kipper, and hopefully he plays just as well next year. The next thing that we looked at was who would be the first call-up for this team, and we looked at uh, forwards and defense. So if you remember your picks were Poirier on the forward and Anderson on the defense, I don't even remember who the first forward call-up was. I guess Jankowski. Yeah. Um, and then I suggested Shin Carrick and Anderson. So we'll give ourselves both a point on the defense. Neither of us got the forward. I didn't Oh, we said not including Jankowski because we both yeah. thought he'd be the first. So yeah. neither of our guys got called up. Yeah. So either way, we sucked on that one. <laughs> we both got a half point. We, we picked yeah. a defenseman. The defense was easy. Yeah. Um, and the next one was not about new guys coming in, but about guys leaving who would be the first player traded. The first player traded this year was Eddie Lack. I think really the only flame traded. Yeah. Um, I had suggested Brower. You thought he'd be Brower or Kulak. Yeah, and here we are at the end of the season with Troy Brower still aflame, and the Brower play potentially having cost us most of our season. Yeah. Uh, we asked, "What would the Flames have to do to be successful this season?" And we both had the same answer in one sense and a, a different answer in another sense. So we both said they had to win the division. I need that womp womp sound on my soundboard right now. Yeah, I think they kind of missed out on that for some reason by a little bit. You know, we thought it would be nice and give Vegas a playoff berth, you know. Like yeah. We need a welcome to the league. It's it's their well, it's their housewarming present. Yes. Here, have our spot. That's right. Um, I suggested that goaltending was going to be as a key to winning and winning in the Honda Center, which I guess, if nothing else this season, we finally broke that curse. Yeah. Hopefully they can keep winning in Anaheim and get that stupidity out of the way. Not just, like, one and then, like, lose again for, like, the next ten years. You know, because that's what happened. Like, it, we won the one game in 2004, but, we like, we hadn't won previous to that in since, like, 1998 or something ridiculous like that. So it was, like, one off and then, like, another 14 years of losing. So, you know, we got to just stop losing there, period. Yeah, it's, I don't know, knowing where this team's at, I'm kind of predicting that we go on another slump Yeah. in the Honda Center. Um, you also said that we needed to win a round in the playoffs to be successful, so didn't get that one. Yeah, well, this season in its entirety has probably been the single most disappointing season in Flames history, so yeah, uh, kind of failed to reach any modicum of expectations and we're not the only ones disappointed if you remember our neighbors to the north a lot of hockey pundits at the beginning of the season were predicting Edmonton might win the cup this year and you and I scratched our head we asked will Edmonton win the cup and I said no your quote was 100% marketing so I guess one thing that people thought would happen the world stayed the same and the Oilers missed the playoffs Yep. so at least we're not the only ones we can go golfing with the Oilers now yay well, they went vacationing with them earlier this season in the bye week, so now they can go vacationing with them on the golf course now. Where'd they go, Red Deer? Uh, no, they went to uh, the same hotel in Mexico, oddly enough. Oh, weird. 
Like yeah. the whole teams or just yeah. guys? Yeah, it was pretty much the entire team, uh, each of them, uh, just at the same time. It was kind of weird. Same travel agent, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, let's take a look now at the off season. A lot of things have happened. We'll talk a little bit about what has happened. We'll talk about some speculation. And then look ahead from there. So... Black Garbage Bag Day was Monday. Black Garbage Bag Day, for those that don't know, is when the players come in, they do their eggs interviews, they talk to coaches, managers, and clear out their stuff in a black garbage bag. And, of course, a lot of questions asked of the players, what went wrong, what happened. To me, I didn't put a lot of stock in what the players said, but I really enjoyed hearing what uh, the GM said, Brad for Living. And just a few points here, and then we can talk about this if you want to. Uh, Trilliving took most of the blame onto himself for the season. He said he's the manager here. It's ultimately his, uh, you know, his, I don't want to say job, but it's it's him that it, that's really responsible for this team if they win or lose. I forget the exact words they used, but it's his responsibility if they win or if they lose, and here they lost. And, um, yeah, it was... You know, he really put it on his shoulders. I thought it was a professional thing to do. The thing is, is that the team was kind of relying on two ifs and maybes in their lineup to provide offense. And I think that both Chris Verstig and Yarmir Yager were expected to contribute much in the manner that they did last season. And if they had, the Flames are probably playing on home ice right now. But unfortunately, they both got hurt early, and it was the a hit right to our weakest point in the roster, and we had no internal options to fix it, and there's no easy to acquire players at the deadline because that's always the worst time to go buying for. Even at that point, I think it was too little, too late. Yeah, so you're kind of screwed, and is that True Living's fault? Partially, but it's kind of understandable that you would have one expected that some of one of the players would have turned out from Stockton. Frankly, when you have guys like Shin Carrick, Poirier, Klimchuk, Fu, you you know Manjapane, Jankowski, like you'd expect someone to step up and none of them did and we talked about that with kevin last week and i still maintain the gm's job is to put the right guys in flames jerseys and i still think he did that yeah and it just it injuries and like we heard about monahan having four surgeries like injuries pretty much tanked the flame season and it you know, you don't want to ever, you know, have that as a, your excuse because the team should have done better. But when you have two of your top seven offensive forwards getting hurt right off the hop to start the season and nobody comes up to replace them, it, it there's only so much that you can do. That's it. And I don't think that's necessarily the GM's issue. I mean, he he put the right... I still think he put the right young depth players in the right spots. They just didn't mature as quickly as we needed them to. No. Uh, True Living also said that we can't just react to react. We can't just make a move to make a move. And I th- he didn't say it, but I think he was coming out pretty much saying we can't just fire the coach to do something. To say, oh, we're angry and we need to fire the coach. He talked a lot about how... And we always hear Trill even say this. There's a process. And we need to you know, spend the time to evaluate everything. He even said he needs to be evaluated. His job needs to be evaluated and make sure he did it right. So we didn't see, as I expected, the coach to be moved right away. But I don't know if it will happen now. He did also say we've got a good coach. And I think, I mean, you're not going to throw your coach, coach under the bus. But after hearing what he said, I'm less convinced that the coach is out of here now i think i'm at about a 50 50 yeah and if the flame is keep gullitson and they have even remotely a bad start to the season then both of them should get fired well and i think that'll be i mean uh, brian burke's a smart hockey guy i still believe that i don't like the guy necessarily but i think he's a good hockey guy and i think that'll be a big thing he has to look at with you know his 
uh, eyes to say, okay, Tree, you know, here's what we got to do. And Tree might like him, but ultimately Burke is present hockey ops, and I can see that coming down from above Tree. Yeah, and it's one of those things that a large portion of the Flames' problem was execution based on the type of players that the Flames have. And, like, if you look at Mike Smith, he's a very good offensive goaltender, which is weird. But um, the Flames also have, like, four really good offensive defensemen. And we never used them in an offensive capacity this season. And... uh, like you used to under Hartley you would see the defenseman constantly jumping into the play and especially with the Flames having trouble scoring when you have weapons that you can use and you don't use them what are you doing and I it's this season reminded me of Brent Sutter's team and where like he didn't use Jay Bomeister because of, in the manner that he played because of the fact that oh well you're not supposed to go rushing towards the goaltender when that's how he was successful in Florida and the Flames just didn't seem to use the weapons that they have effectively and like trying to get the Flames to play sort of like the Pittsburgh Penguins when they're not built like that and it's just a yeah a a lot of (laughs) issues there the last thing that i thought was interesting for living mentioned is that we have some deficiencies and he said there's some skill deficiency which i mean we talked about the right wing i wouldn't necessarily talk about i don't know if we want to get into coaching again we've beaten that drum quite a bit but um I think that, you know, he said there's skill deficiency and a little mental deficiency. And when he said mental deficiency, meant confidence, etc. So I don't know how you go about, you know, training or working with your guys on their confidence. But the fact the GM mentioned that at the end of season scrum tells you that it's something that's been on their mind for a while and something they think they have to fix. So I don't know if that means bringing in, you know, mental health professionals to work with the team or trying to put them through more adversity and see how they fare i'm not really sure but you know it's something that will be front and center for this organization in the offseason. well you have to look at the uh, the main players on this team save kachuk were able to play the right way under hartley and they were the never say die kids and like they were never out of it and they'd always be trying to get back into the games if they were down and that attitude of never say die died when Hartley left and now this team has no mental fortitude whatsoever and it's like what you were saying earlier where like the coaching staff seems to have like an HR problem on how to properly motivate the players and like we both didn't like Hartley but at least he was able to get the most out of them and I don't feel that Gullitson has been getting the most out of the players and yeah the Flames do have a talent deficiency they need a scorer they need two scorers really and it doesn't mean that like you need somebody that's like a top top player but just somebody like who has somewhat of a similar shot to Furland. Like, you know, just somebody who can take Gaudreau's passes and put them in the net. And so that's where the talent deficiency comes in. But it's just, yeah, it, all of it. it. It's like every single thing that could go wrong with this team did this season, and it's just really frustrating. Yeah, but at the same time, I'm almost kind of, you know, bad things come in threes. I think we can probably look at this as... You know, with injuries, with the lack of depth, with the coaching, it's over, and hopefully now we can move on and not have, oh, we're so close, but one more thing happens next year. I'm kind of looking at it as, okay, things went off the rails, it's done, it's over, and we can move on. Hopefully. Hopefully. 
So Matt, let's speculate a little bit about this offseason. So I have some questions for you that we'll go back and forth on. First one is what do the Flames have to do this offseason? If you're the GM, what are the, you know, we've seen them every summer kind of focus on one thing. Last last summer he focused on uh, defense. Summer four he focused on defense. I guess you could say goaltending last year too with Smith. But what what's the one or two things you think Tree has to do this summer? He needs to get a top six scorer. And... There is some thought of moving Dougie Hamilton up to right wing, and that could work. And especially with ha- having to go get a top three defenseman. Yeah, uh, you just put Brody on back on the first pair. You move Stone up, and you have Anderson play. It, you know, it like you can get it to work, or you move Kulak up, one or the other. But either way, there's a way of doing it, and. Like, yeah, you're going to create a little bit of a hole, but you could also make a trade with, say, Hamilton for a right winger, but then, you, you know, you're losing Hamilton out of your team entirely. So it it's one of those things that the team definitely needs one scorer, and I would prefer to get two if possible. Um, that They need to get guys where, like, they have a scoring threat on each line and I think like on the first line you have Gaudreau uh, uh, obviously and Monaghan being both good playmakers and Monaghan's a good finisher but having a third scorer on that line would be fine and Kachuk's a good finisher on the second line and I think Bennett and Jankowski could be good finishers on the third line it's just you need to have a little bit more talent sprinkled throughout the lineup that this team just doesn't have right now. Do you still think, I mean, you've been one of the biggest proponents of changing coaching. Do you think that they have to make a coaching move this summer? I, frankly, right now, uh, I am a little bit on the surprise uh, side of things that we haven't seen Gullitson get fired already. So do you want my thought on that? Sure. Humboldt. He's a Saskatchewan guy. He was down in Humboldt. I think it might be a bad PR move for them to can him right now. I think that they need that goodwill. They need the guy from that community. Yeah. As long as it gets done at some point, I think it needs to be done. And, you know, I don't have any personal animus towards Glenn Gullitson. I actually think he's a nice guy. I, I like him as a person. It's just... For whatever reason, this season didn't work, and like as I said earlier, like this has been probably the single most disappointing season in Flames history. You have to do something, and like it's unfortunate that you know I'm pointing to the coaching staff, but you can't trade twenty players. And Tree says that in his exit interview too, right? We can't move twenty guys out. No, uh, it's fr- frustrating because sometimes you'd like to, <laughs> but it, it, you know that's just not feasible unless you're wanting to like tank and rebuild right away. <laughs> so, I mean, with that in mind, the fact that you can't move twenty guys and the fact there will probably be some moves this summer, who do you look at right now as the untradeable or the untouchable piece in this roster? Now, of course, I know you'll probably say, "Well, for the right price, anyone's tradable." But if you're looking at your at your roster. Who do you look at and say, you know what, these are my core pieces. These are the pieces that would take, you know, such a big deal. No one would probably be able to match it to to move them. The only two players that I think I would consider completely untradeable is Matthew Kachuk and Sean Monahan. Interesting. Because Monahan is very clutch, and that is very important when it comes to the playoffs and like in the series against Anaheim he was the only player playing effectively offensively and so many game winning goals this season and throughout his career he just seems to and first line centers were always impossible to come by so it just doesn't make any sense to move him at all and Kachuk has the right attitude and personality and skill level that the flames need so that'd be the only two i'll take a chuck as well um i will add to that just like you did monahan but i'm not a third guy and to me that's dougie hamilton i think with a 24 year old defenseman who 
I mean, last year had 50 points. This year had 44 points. That's an asset I really want to hang on to. And he would be one of the players I'd trade. <laughs> Interesting. See, I think at 24 in the contract he's on, I think that um, unless you really need him, I think that there's still a lot of upside there. Yeah. Unless you need him to make a deal work, there's a lot of upside there. So. Oh. Interesting. Um, if the Flames were to make a move, there's always those moves when you look at it, and I know for me, Jerome was one of those moves, but who would it really sting to have the move? Like, who would you be sad and, you know, really have that, oh, wow, that stings, that guy's, you know, a fan favorite or my favorite or whatever if they were to move certain players in the offseason? Not a single one, other than Kachuk or Monaghan. I think it would sting for me if Brody got moved just because I like his story. He's, you know, been with this organization forever. We saw him come up from, you know, the lowly guy who wore number 66 to being a top pairing defenseman here. We all like him, and to me that one would sting a little bit. I, I think it'll happen, but I think especially for a lot of this fan base, uh, number seven moving is going to sting. As far as the forwards go, I don't think there's anyone there that was probably going to sting that I can see them moving. Um, again, I think Kachuk definitely would, but that's a whole another level. The only other guy that would sting for me would be Smitty, which, again, I don't see him moving. Yeah. Uh, frankly, I, I just don't really... like. How would you say, after a season like this past one... Like obviously, like the management and all that knows what the problems are in terms of the room and all of that kind of stuff. So it's one of those things where, like, if certain players are getting traded, I'm a little less inclined to be disappointed if a player got traded. It's sort of like when the Flames traded Dion Phaneuf. Like, a lot of people were pissed off when that happened, but I was not at all, because Phaneuf was the, not uh, having the personality that you need to have a winning player, and I so, like, with him moving on, like, yeah, the return was disappointing, but him being removed from the team didn't affect me at all. And so, like, but I don't it, think we really had a lot of people at that point in Calgary who were Dion fans anymore. I think this whole fan base had soured on him. I can't think of anyone that was really sad to see him go. I can think of people that weren't happy with the return, but I can't think of anyone at the time who was sad to see him go. No. So, you know, it's one of those things where, like, if, like, say Hamilton or Gaudreau got traded, uh, it's unlikely that either would. But it would sting yeah. for me if Gio got traded. Yeah, it, you know, like, all of the players, like, you might like them, but, like, there's obviously some sort of reason why player X got included in the deal. So it's just a hockey deal, right? It's the piece you needed to get a deal done. Yeah. But, I mean, we've even seen in the past when we've had players that weren't that great a player, like uh, McGratton, right? And we just fall in love with them as a fan base. And then they, they move, and it always stings for a little bit. Yeah. I think Furland's going to be the next guy like that. Everyone's fallen in love with him here. and I mean, we'll talk about this more next year, but I still think he's done by the end of uh, the deadline here. I think they'll move him out. I uh, I actually think that he's probably the most single most likely player to get traded this offseason. Just I because, think, like, if you, like, say the Flames are wanting to get a scorer. Well, hey, this guy has scored 20-plus goals this past season. You know, like, we can include this and pieces x y and z into the deal to get that top six forward yeah i don't disagree i just think that by trade deadline 2019 he's out of here it could be earlier yeah could be later um who on this team do you think has to go is there anyone you look at and you know say this guy's got to be out of here as soon as we can get him out of here um Not really, like, yeah, of course I'd like Troy Brower not to be in the organization just because of the fact that it's right now a waste of cap space. If we're paying Brower a million bucks, I think he'd be a good fourth liner. Yeah, it's just having a four and a half million dollar fourth line press box caliber player kind of sucks. But Right now I'd rather keep him in than buy him out. Yeah, next offseason, buy him out. 
but this season it's just it'll cost too much for too long anyone else you look at that you say this guy's gotta go um just running my th- mind through the roster uh not really like there's like it, it, you gotta figure that like say that if the flames trade one of the defensemen for a forward then they're going to have uh, a need for michael stone being playing more of a role on the team so like other than that like stone would be like the if he's going to be the number five i think that would be someone to go but but i don't think he will be next year so yeah it there's not really too many that like uh, this player has to get out of the organization because like the main players that would be on that list are already departing via ufa yeah i agree Uh, there's nobody i look at and say we got to get rid of this guy there's a bad contract or two, but I think Brower has shown himself to be more useful. And I think right now, cap management-wise, we're better to keep him around than buy him out. We're already paying Mason Raymond, Lance Boma, and Ryan Murphy, who we all paid to go away. I don't want to add a fourth guy to that right now. Yeah, and like if the Flames were to buy him out right now, like we'd be on the hook for the buyout for four years. Whereas if we do it next season, it's only for that next season and the year after. So it's not nearly as bad. So yeah. it's no, more it's more stomachable anyway. <laughs> the last question I'll ask you as we speculate the offseason is, do you think the Flames have more of a need to add in the offseason or subtract in the offseason? We've heard a lot of rumblings lately about maybe there's some guys who... Uh, were detractors for this team. Maybe those guys who mentally weren't uh, where they need to be. Maybe those guys who didn't put in the effort they needed. Do you think that the when we look at this team opening day next year, we're going to say, wow, by moving so-and-so or getting rid of so-and-so, we're better? Or do you think it's going to be by adding so-and-so, we're, we're better? Well, I think the main thing that the Flames need to do is get a couple of personalities back into the the organization. And I think that the Flames deleting Derek England from the roster had a significantly larger impact on the team than I think anybody would like to admit. And, uh, y- you know, it's one of those situations where they need to have some guys with leadership abilities, even if they're just fourth line players or like your third pairing defensemen. They need to get some more guys that have that leadership skill. Whether you can get a top six forward or a bottom six forward, it, they just need more leadership overall. And I think that was lacking. And I think a lot of that comes with the right veteran pieces. Yeah. I and mean, I th- I've talked for a while. I think there's a need, especially depth need, for veterans on any playoff contending team. Yeah. And I think that the Flames need to go shopping for two fourth line forwards and in UFA and getting two top nine forwards as well. I think so- one of those depth guys could come in a trade. I could see if they move somebody like Brody out of getting, you know, a, a good player or a good prospect and a depth veteran forward somebody's looking to get rid of. Yeah, that's possible. I don't think you shop for that player, but I think it's, oh, hey, let's throw this guy in to, you know, meet a need that we have. Yeah, and there are plenty of guys all around the NHL uh, every year during UFA that kind of fit that category of decent veteran guy. And I think, you know, like, say like a guy like Jason Chimera when he was with the Capitals, like just a decent role player that's and the guy though i hope we don't go out and try to buy July no 1st. no i know uh that he's already way past his prime so like yeah no not him but that generic type of guy yeah that's the that's the move i think i would look at as we get sort of like even versteeg where we signed him opening day i think that's a move we make late july early august yeah so he's available news cheap all right, Matt, I've got a, an interesting theory. Uh, actually, before I move on, I'll, uh, I'll answer this one. I think the Flames' biggest... Yeah, I think they need some pieces. I don't think we're going to see them make a huge splash. We're going to go, oh, we got Tavares. We're a better team. And there's some retooling to happen here. But I think, honestly, 
we're going to see this team get better by subtraction. Like you were saying, I think management knows there's certain guys that need to go. There's certain guys that maybe need to move on. Not that we're going to release them. And of course, we'll get something from them But I think in a deal. But I think that we'll look back and say the team is better because we no longer have certain... I don't know who they are, but certain players have been moved. So I think this is going to be... I think moving those certain personalities out and getting new guys in, it's sort of going to be a bit of both, but I think there's certain players right now that need to go. Yeah. I know, and it's... This team has a handful of personalities in the organization that I think are detracting from the team overall. And you look at a guy like Dougie Hamilton, and this, this is why I'm kind of on the maybe we should trade him thing is that a player with his profile Boston's always been a fairly competently run team and why would you trade a young guy like that for what they got for him and that always raised a bit of an eyebrow because like he's always been a good player it's just you know I don't know if that might be a problem with him specifically it's just yeah i just don't know like i know that there's obviously some problems like uh, when uh gullets yeah, and that, Bo- that boston leadership team though i mean they traded sagan out of there too and they made some questionable decisions during that time yeah well um like i just look at uh like when glenn gulletson threw his stick and the player some of the players were being were kind of laughing about it in the interviews afterwards and two of them were Hamilton and Stajan that were laughing about it and that's not the type of reaction that I would find acceptable you know yeah but but I think too that's immaturity I mean he's 24 you know and I think that that's where you need that veteran guy to step in and say guys this isn't how we do this this isn't how we act here and I think it's, I don't know, I think that's something that is just an immaturity thing with Hamilton. Mm-hmm. And Stajan's had a lot of coaches. He's a veteran guy. I think he's probably seen a lot of those kind of outbursts over the years. And you got to admit, it was kind of funny. Yeah. It's just that that's not the type of reaction that I would find correct in that situation. Like We've all acted incorrectly at some point in our life. True. But, you know, we're not getting paid millions of dollars and having a disappointing season, so... You know. <laughs> um, so here's my crazy idea I wanted to float by you. If we talk about who we were talking about earlier as the untouchables, I still believe that in maybe two, three years, Matthew Kachuk is going to be the number one left winger on this team. I think he, he exceeds Goudreau as that star left winger. So at what point do the Flames have to look at what could we get for Johnny Goudreau before it's too late and he becomes, you know, Jerome McGinley who we're trading for peanuts because we waited too late, but... What can we get for Goudreau, and when is it time to say, is Goudreau better to us as a trade chip? Well, if you look at the Philadelphia Flyers, they had two dynamite scorers in Mike Richards and Jeff Carter. And they were their team had the exact same problem that the Flames do with immaturity problems. And those two players specifically were two of the main reasons for the immaturity problems and they ended up dealing both of them and they ended up trading Richards to LA for uh, Simmons and Shen and Carter for Voracek and while those players on those teams were just depth young kids that didn't establish themselves they ended up emerging as legitimate top tier talents in Philadelphia and were in fact eventually better than both Carter and Richards. So, and while LA benefited eventually by uh, getting Carter as well and winning a couple of cups, it ended up working better for Philadelphia in terms of their organization. And I think that if the Flames were to entertain a Gaudreau trade, you're likely going to be targeting young talent that's from good teams that is not getting opportunities that they should and 
where Calgary could take advantage. And it would take a lion's share of talent to get somebody like a Goudreau from us. But, like... It, it's possible, and I I think that there are a number of teams that could conceivably deal with Calgary where it would make sense for the Flames to do it. It's just... It's I don't not, think you can do a Goudreau deal for a bunch of you know draft picks and prospects. I think it's got to be, like you said, kind of a high-end talent for a high-end talent. Yeah, and you'd likely be getting guys that are like 20 like sam bennett's age give or take that are showing upper end potential but are on like a stack team so sort of like uh, tyler sagan with De- uh, boston where like you could see that he had a lot of talent but he was a little bit down in their lineup because they were a cup caliber team I look at that as almost the Seth Jones for Ryan Johansson trade. Like, just two teams swapping young players who they each address their need. And that's where I could see maybe, okay, you know what, Kachuk's a great left winger. We got Monty at center. Let's move Goudreau on for, you know, a right winger, something that we could really use there. Yeah, and I think that if the Flames were to trade Goudreau, we'd be getting multiple forwards for him, not just one. But that's again where, and I'm not saying that you do this off season, but maybe that's where you get you know the pinnacle piece, and then you know the piece that goes with it. Sort of like in the Toronto deal, it was Dion Phaneuf and Freddie Schuestrom. Yeah. You know, like you can get that depth piece that goes along with him. But I don't think you know. I think Goudreau might be, and I don't think you trade him anytime soon because he's still useful. But I think in the next two three years, that could be the Flames' biggest bargaining chip. Yeah. And it, you know, especially with the Flames' struggles, I think that there's there would be more inclined to do it. Especially, like, if you... You gotta figure that if you have Sam Bennett playing on the second line and Kachuk up on the first line, and you could kind of draw some talent from both Stockton and the trade itself to fill out the other parts like the team could conceivably be better off in some ways but it that would be one hell of a tra- difficult trade to make and like yeah. it, it, see, and, I, and i don't want them to get you know a bunch of pieces like for stockton and stuff i think it's got to be superstar for superstar maybe one other piece but i don't want to be like jerome where we're getting a whole bunch of you know weird stuff thrown our way yeah, well, I think that you'd almost be, like, getting, like... Uh, it, it, I think it would be something along the lines of, like, Simmons and Shen from L.A. for Richards, where you're getting two guys that are showing upper-end potential, but maybe not getting the playing time to use it. It's interesting you mentioned Simmons and Shen, because, I mean, we know that Goudreau's from that Philadelphia area... I could see that being... I'm not saying I want Simmons. I think you got to trade for a guy who's as old as Goudreau or younger to make it really work. But um, I could definitely see Philadelphia being a destination that might pay a premium for him. Yeah, I think there's a number of teams, primarily on the East Coast, that would make sense. It's just... It, it'd have to be the right deal and yeah and i don't think this off season don't get me wrong is not the right time to do it i think we need other guys to emerge first into their you know kind of their roles but i think that if you're the gm you've got to have that in the back of your mind for off season 2019 off season 2020 of you know is this a player we can move well we're there's still value there yeah and i think of all the teams uh that uh tampa might actually make the most sense to deal with but that's if that were to happen but yeah a long shot of long shots anyway i think the other thing that would be very attractive is his contract i mean he's got a great deal and i think that's one of the things that would make him very attractive for other teams to potentially you know pay us a little bit more is they're they're going to get a star player at not a star player cost yeah well, Matt, we, last week when we were working with Kevin doing our show, we talked about the RFAs and broke down who we thought should stay, who we thought should go. Uh, why don't we look at the UFAs this year and talk, or this week and see who we think should stay and go? Sound good to you? Yep. 
All right, I'll throw out a name. You tell me stay or go. Let's start with Matt Stajan. I think he's done in the NHL and definitely not back with Calgary at all. So what what would you think of the Flames off from less than a million as the 13th forward? I would not like that. I've been debating that over the last week or so. I've heard a few people suggest that. I think especially because we're saying they need some veteran leadership, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I don't want him to play a lot in the lineup, but I think he could be that veteran voice, that veteran guy in the dressing room and play sort of the Freddie Hamilton role. I think that the Flames need to change the culture, and if they're going to get a veteran guy, get a different veteran guy. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see both ways. For a long time, I said, you know what, let's get rid of Stajan, um, but I'm starting to come around to maybe he's a good uh, 13th forward. But no, I can see where you're coming from. I can, however, see Stajan being given the Conroy treatment. They find some sort of front office job for him. Yeah, I could see that too. Like, I have no problem with Stajan as a person. So, you know, like, he's a decent guy. So, yeah, if he wants to stay in Calgary, be my guest. How about Chris for Stieg? Uh, injured, don't bother. To me, he's, a, again, a good veteran guy, but he's been injured way too much. That was the knock even when we got him. We've given him two years. It doesn't work. I think you're going to replace that position again. I think he needs to replace with a veteran guy, but you can get a better, healthier veteran guy for the same price. Yeah. And even if you have to spend a little bit of money to, like, upgrade, like, even if you're spending, like, three and a half to get somebody who can be a top nine forward to replace for Stieg, but somebody that'll be actually in the lineup, I think that'd be vastly more important. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll go with the same as you. I think you could spend a little more there. I, I was kind of disappointed Versteeg got as much of a bump in salary this year as he did. I'm just checking where he's at. He's at 175. I wouldn't want to go more than two for that position, so I don't think you can bump them much. Um, but, you know, I'd be willing to go like 1 million, 9, 50, something like that, but uh, you can't go much. If you get a top nine forward, even if it's just a one year deal under 3 million, like that, that's okay. You know, it's not great, but it as long as it's just a one year deal, like any any contract really on a one year deal, who one cares? One year we could do it, but I would like to kind of sign like Versteeg's thirty one. I'd like to bring in a guy who's thirty one on a good deal for maybe two years, just so you've got him here. Yeah. Um, so I think it's time. I mean, it's been fun for having Versteeg here. He's been a good veteran leader guy, but I think it's time for him to move on just because. He's not healthy, and I think that he may not play pro hockey again because of it. Yeah. He's the kind of guy, though, I could see ending up as a junior coach or a college coach or something. He, just, he seems to love the game. Yep. Uh, what about Tanner Glass? Yeah, I kind of. Like, if you want to sign him for Stockton, sure. That's about it. Like, uh, yeah. It's like, okay, sure. I think Tanner Glass is a guy we let go on July 1st, and if there's no better option, you come back to him. But I think that uh, he didn't he didn't look great in Stockton. He didn't look great in the NHL. I think there's a better way to spend that contract spot. Yeah. It, it would only be an AHL contract and, like, AHL-only contract. I so don't... you're thinking, like, the Heat sign him as opposed to the Flames. Yeah. Okay, well, that'd be different. But I don't want the Flames using one of their 50 contracts. No. Um, a guy I could see coming back is Merrick Krivik. We got a little bit of a look at him. He's an older guy. He's a veteran guy. I can see him coming back as a uh, two-way guy the Flames intend to put in the AHL. Um, he, I don't think he got a fair shake with his injury, and I could see them giving him another season. Yeah, Derek Grant 2.0. Yeah, and there's a need for that in every organization. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with them. You know, it, it depends a lot if uh, the Flames move on from any of the forward prospects, the older guys. But, yeah, I don't... You know, if the Flames keep him or they don't, I don't really think it matters either way. Like, he's just the, your generic fill-in guy, regardless. What about Luke Gazdick, another generic fill-in plugger guy? Yeah, if it's a Stockton-only thing, sure. Like, I don't uh, want the Flames spend yeah. a contract spot on him. No. Uh, one of those the late season signings was Cody Goluboff. He played in Stockton all season, um, and he was down there. He played 43 games, had eight goals, 10 assists for 18 points. The Flames signed him right after the Olympics to a one-year deal. Do you think they bring him back? Again, 
If Stockton wants him, sure. I can see the Flames signing him to an NHL deal. Um, I mean, he's on one now, but I just think that they might sign him in that deal again just to sort of be that elder statesman and that emergency backup guy. Yeah. I think that you could get away with just having him as the AHL only guy and then, like, if need happens during the season and you need to recall him, then you just sign him that day. I think, too, because of his Olympic background, there might be some teams looking to find cheap hole guy, you know, cheap guys to fill holes, and I think the Flames might have to sign him just to keep him in Stockton. Yeah. I either way, like, am I gonna lose any sleep if he signs somewhere else? No. So I can I can honestly see him being the next Watherspoon, that older guy who just never makes it to the NHL, and the Flames keeping the A forever. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, Tyler Watherspoon becomes a an UFA this summer. Do you think they keep him around? They could. I don't really see any point in doing so, but they could. I think the Flames will sign Watherspoon, bring him up, and make him the seventh defenseman, make him the new Matt Bartkowski. That conceivably could work. It's his time. I mean, if if he's going to rot in the AHL otherwise, every team's got a Tyler Watherspoon. You don't, you're don't. you not going to trade him. So I can see him saying, you know what, Tyler, you've been here. Let's bring you up. Let's give you a few games to see what you can do. Yeah, could be. Or he walks. Either way, like, you I know. I just think if he walks, he's not going to go anywhere. Like, everybody's got a Tyler Watherspoon. Yeah. I think it's in his best interest to sign if the Flames will put a deal in front of him. Yeah. With that, though, I think the guy we were talking about, Matt Barkowski, is out of here. The Flames really yeah, signed him same for one here. purpose. And that purpose was uh, another body for the expansion draft. He's looked terrible this year. And I wouldn't even bring him back, I don't think. I mean, if the Heat want to sign him, great. But I wouldn't even bring him back and then assign him to the A. I think it's time to move on. Yeah. Um, a name that not a lot of Flames fans know is Dalton Prout, the guy that we got from New Jersey in exchange for Eddie Lack. He's there. Uh, you know, it, just your typical fill-in yeah, extra. Yeah, I'd be okay to use a fill-in contract on him, but I think he'll, again, I think him, Watherspoon, there's sort of a whole range of guys there that, you know, they just shuffle around every year. Yeah. So that Josh Juris, they're there to, you know, fill your roster for cheap. And I think those are two guys that could stay or could go. We don't really care, but someone will will come in that we won't know any better than those guys. Yeah, exactly. The next three are names we probably know. I think I know both of our answer to this one, but uh, the man they call GOAT, number 68, Yermer Yagi. I think he's back. I think he thinks he can come back. I, I think he will play in the NHL next season. I just don't see it with us and it was nice having him here it's just every his season mirrored the flames if it could go wrong it would and it did and it, it just was a complete disaster i think that he does have more in the tank and whether he's playing in Claudno or he comes to to back to the NHL yet to be seen but we'll see I think he will come to a training camp I don't think he makes an NHL roster I think he thinks he can I think someone will bring him in a camp and he's not going to do it and he'll end up playing in the Czech League yep. uh, and the next two guys are the newest Flames the ones that we got at the trade deadline uh, the first one being Nick Shore what do you think of Nick absolutely Shore? yes I like I liked him when he was with LA. I liked him ever since he's been here. The handful of games he's played, I think he's done a very good job. Stajan's replacement, perfect fourth line center, everything that you would want. So yeah, he's making less than a million right now. I think you could easily could probably get him for a million or less. And I think oh, even if you even if you have to spend one and a half, that's fine. Like there's uh, it's not a problem. He's he's doing a good job, so that you don't mind spending a little bit of money if the player's doing a good job. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd give him a long-term deal, but I'd give him at least a season or two. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that's a position you sign, and I could easily see Nick Shore becoming that 13th forward. You sign it saying, okay, who's going to take this job? Nick Shore is here as our insurance. Can anybody take the job? Yep. And a million five, you're happy to sit him in the press box. Yep. Um, and lastly, Chris Stewart. Uh, thanks for coming out. 
Stewart's an interesting guy. He seems to float around from team to team, and I, I don't know where his next stop will be. Uh, it won't be here. He's, it, it was a it was a good shot to take, but it didn't work. And when oh you well. get acquired to the deadline and sat on the bench more than you play, or sat in the box more than you play, you know it's kind of a failure. Yeah, I uh, don't think that he actually plays in the NHL next season. I kind of thought if we were going to be a um, a playoff team, he might sort of be that guy who comes in and sort of you know saves the day, that unsung hero. Yeah. But yeah, it's not that meant didn't. To be. Yeah, that didn't quite work. So of all these guys, we said probably uh, Shore comes back, maybe Watherspoon and Golubov and everyone else and Horivik and everyone else is sort of on their way out. Yeah, and even Golubov and Horivik, it's and even Watherspoon really, like it, I'd put it at less than fifty percent on each of them. This team though likes their guys they're familiar with. True. They they seem to. Um, they seem like they would rather go with what they know than sign somebody, especially in a depth role, that they don't. Yeah. So we'll see what see what happens there. Yeah. Well, uh, the last thing we should do is look at our last poll for the for the year. We've been doing a weekly poll every week this season and had some some really good fan feedback from it. Last week when we were talking with Kevin from. Uh, from his podcast, from Agree or Disagree, the podcast, we asked, should Brad Treliving come back as Flames GM next season? Matt, what do you think? I think so. I think so, too. And most of our fans agreed with us. 83% of respondents said yes. Nobody said no. One person said they're undecided. And nobody said they don't care either way. So I think he's one of the best GMs we've had in a while. Yeah. Um, he's. I think he's got his head on straight. And if nothing else, the man's a wizard at getting good deals on contracts. Yeah, I have not no real qualms about anything he's done. It's just we'll have to see. And like everything, it just depends on how. Like if this team stalls out at any point in the next two three years, then maybe you look at replacing the GM. But for now, like this season was a major problem and if they can fix that major problem by addressing the area that I feel is the biggest one then you and they respond that's good if not then the, that's a whole different <laughs> ball game but just you know. looking around I don't see anyone where I say you know what I would rather have X guy than Trilliving no and I think that we we also need to give Trillivin some time. It's his first GM job, and he's doing a good job. And as we talked about, he's putting the right Flames in a Flames jersey. And I think as long as he keeps doing that, you got to keep him here. Yeah, I agree. Um, so with that, I want to remind everybody that this is probably our last show until... June-ish. So, sometime in June, we're still debating what we're going to do for our draft show because we don't have any draft picks. So we will wait and see how the whole summer shakes out. But we'll be back when there's something to talk about, whether it's the draft, whether it's a coach being fired, whatever that might be. So make sure you follow us either on Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're Fireside Chat. Uh, so that's facebook.com slash Fireside Chat or our website, firesidechat.ca, to stay in touch with what we're doing and when we'll be back. Or the best thing, subscribe to the podcast or your favorite podcast software on your phone and you'll get it whenever we're back. So stay in touch over the summer that way. And also, if you've got any thoughts as things happen about the coach, the GM, whatever you want, we'll still be taking your voicemails and texts over the summer. We won't read them for a while because we won't have a show, but you can text us or send us a voicemail to 587-200-7176, and we'll go through those if we have any next time we broadcast. So, Matt, with that, I have one question for you. Um... Uh, uh, before we wrap up the show, who are you cheering for in the playoffs? Nobody. Nobody? Are you going to watch any playoff hockey? I will, but I just... I wait to see uh, it, which storyline gets me. Like, last season, it was obviously the pan uh, Predators. But, yeah, uh, I still think that in the Eastern Conference, the team to beat is the Pittsburgh Penguins. And I think in the West, it's going to be... Uh, 
probably either Winnipeg or Nashville, whoever wins from the the central division and yeah uh, i i think the conference finals will end up being pittsburgh versus boston and nashville versus whichever of the pacific teams that makes it through i think we're gonna have a nashville boston final yeah i could see that nashville boston or nashville pittsburgh i think is how far do you think vegas goes uh, out in round one. Yeah, it's been a fun run, but it's like it's got to end pretty quick. Yeah, I don't see... I, LA is a good team, and while they are not high in the standings, they're always a bit of a bear in the playoffs, and they have the experience where Vegas doesn't, so... They're good enough to get rid of Vegas. I don't know if they'll get rid of anybody else, but they're no. good enough to get rid of Vegas. Yeah, actually, I think that the Kings could be the Pacific Division representative in the conference finals, but yeah, uh, could and be. then getting trounced by either Winnipeg or Pip, uh, Nashville. Yeah, they very well could be. If one of the Canadian teams is going to win the cup, it'll be Winnipeg. I think Toronto's out in round one. Yeah, I don't see Toronto going very far either. I think Toronto and Vegas are going to be, when we look back, a lot of people are going to say they're the disappointing teams that were out maybe earlier than their fans thought they should be. Yeah. Well, Matt, before we go this week, I just want to remind everybody we're going to do as we always do, and we have our listener survey. This is something that we do online. Uh, we ask everyone to fill it out. It gives us some information about what you guys like, what you might want changed. We made some changes this season um, just based on your feedback, and it's something that we we value that opinion. We're not going to sell your name. We're not going to do anything with it. It's just for us to learn from you. But we will offer you the same thing we do every year. We have a Flames prize pack. I'll post a photo of that in the coming weeks on the website. And if you leave us at the bottom of the survey your name and email address, we'll enter you into a random draw, and we'll do that in August. So. You can fill it out and not leave us any information, or if you want to leave your name and email, we'll enter you in a draw for a Flames and Fireside Chat prize pack. We've got some cool stuff in there. And you can always take that survey on our website at firesidechat.ca slash survey. So, Matt, with that, I guess this is where we bid each other adieu for another uh, Flames season. It's too early, and I, it means we're not going to be talking hockey for a while. It's going to be weird to have that void in our lives. Oh, I know. Well, I was expecting at least a few more shows, but, you know, oh well, it is what it is. You know, it and still feels like winter frankly, outside, with this though, season. It still feels like hockey season. Yeah. Well, as long as the team doesn't do anything rash or stupid in terms of, like, trying to rush things too quickly where they get desperate because oh this season was so bad so let's trade another first round pick or something you know like just be patient like we see with winnipeg that they've been extremely patient and over the last five years and they ended up becoming one of the top teams in the league so the flames have a lot of the parts that they need it's just a little bit of tweaking here and there and everything will be fine. It's just frustrating. I'm confident we have the right leadership team to make those changes. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. But, um, yeah, I, I think that it's going to be – I think it will be a slow summer. I'm not expecting a lot to happen yet. But I think come draft and July 1st, there's going to be some interesting stories here. Yeah. I think that – I I'm expecting about six, seven, eight – changes to the roster in terms of players total i think you see one big change and a bunch of minor changes yeah exactly all right matt well enjoy your uh i guess enjoy your spring and we'll talk again probably in late june yeah thanks for listening once again everybody it's been a blast and looking forward to talking hockey down the road in our 181st episode sometime in june yeah Closing in on 200. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.